it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Welcome, I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we want to continue the series on gospel foundations. In the last video, we, we discussed the question, what does it mean that Jesus is Lord? And uh, when did he become Lord? How long is he going to be Lord? And we discussed those matters. We basically summed up the fact that, what does it mean that he is Lord? Uh, we could see in Acts chapter 2, verse 34. For David has not descended to the heavens, yet he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And we looked back to Psalm 110, which said, The Lord said to my Lord, which means Yahweh said to my Adonai uh, that uh, he would sit at, to sit at the right hand. So we noted that Jesus being made Lord means that he was made the king of heaven and earth. That's why in Matthew chapter 28, it says that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So Jesus Christ being made Lord means he's made king over God's kingdom. And we're going to look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel assuredly know that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So this man who was crucified by the, the Jews and the Romans uh, in the first century, this man has been made the king over heaven and earth. He has been made the king over all of God's creation. And so there is a big question that we must ask. Something is often abused with this passage by those that are in the Unitarian camp or in other sects around the world that will deny the divinity of Christ, that will deny the, uh, that, that Jesus is God in the flesh. And they will say, see, it says that God made Jesus Lord. And so if this is the case, and Lord means that he was made king over heaven and earth, king over all of God's kingdom, then we have to ask the question, why is this man, Jesus Christ, worthy? In what way is he worthy to be the king over God's kingdom? Why is it suitable for him to become king of heaven and earth? Because a man shouldn't be there. God should be sitting there. And so we want to go ahead and look through the passages of scripture that are related to this to tell us who it is that this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is who it is that God has made Lord and Christ. So first, let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. We starting If you start in verse 1, it says, God, who at various times spoke to the prophets, verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, whom he made the world. Verse 3. He is the brightness of his glory, the express image of himself, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So in other words, after he went to the cross, after he went as a sacrifice to the cross, then God exalted him at the right hand. He was made Lord of heaven and earth. So who is this one? So we want to focus in on this first part. It says he is the brightness of his glory, just like the... The sun in the sky has a certain glory that comes from it. We might say this, if, if I ask you, have you ever seen the sun in the sky at noonday? You would say, well, of course I have. Many times in my life, almost every day of my life, I've seen the sun. But in reality, you haven't seen the sun. You've only seen the rays, the light of glory that's coming from the sun. You've seen the light from the sun, not the sun itself. And so here we start to get a glimpse of who Jesus Christ is, that he is the brightness of God's glory, that we see God through seeing him. And it goes on and it says, the express image of himself. 
So this means that Jesus is the express image of God the Father. So what does this mean? That he's the express image of God the Father. Express image means the exact image, the exact duplicate of who the Father is. Now, when we use the term image, uh, sometimes we might think of a mirror. Uh, for example, if I go up to a mirror and I look in the mirror, what image am I going to see? I'm going to see an image of myself. But we all know that that image is not exact express image of who I am because that image in the mirror is only two dimensional, whereas I'm three dimensional. Uh, if we think about that, that image in the mirror, uh, we recognize that that image in the mirror is not looking back at me. It doesn't have consciousness, but I have consciousness. So it's not exactly the same thing that in that, uh, that mirror, if I speak to that mirror and looking at my image, the, the lips will move, but there will be no sound that comes out of the mouth because it's not an exact express image. But here we see that Jesus, the Son of God, is the express image of the Father, that he is exactly what the Father is. This is why you could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because he is the express image. Now, when we talk about an image, we know that the image is distinct from the person himself. But at the same time, if it's an exact express image, that image will be exactly like himself. And so here it says very clearly that Jesus Christ, before he was... Uh, before he came to earth, before he became a man, before the word became flesh, he was the express image of God himself. Now, how do we know that this was before? Because it says in verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. So this is speaking about him through the creation, that God created all things through him. We'll see if we go back to John chapter 1, we'll see the same thing expressed in different language. We're trying to understand who this Jesus is, this man, Jesus Christ, that is worthy to be exalted and made Lord, King over heaven and earth. If we go to John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, okay, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. So now we have, a, instead of saying the image, this is, uh, John is expressing it and saying the, in the beginning was the Word. Now, where is the beginning? This is referring back to the, the creation account when it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we're finding out that in the act of that creation that there was another with uh, the Father. There was another with God. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. So again, we see a distinction. Just like if we're talking about an image and the person himself, there's a, a distinction. So here we see God and the word being together with one another in the beginning. So that's why it goes on in verse uh, three. It says, all things were created through him and without him nothing was created that was created. So we see that he was in the beginning during the creation of God and that God all created all things through him. So what does it mean that he is the word? If we want to express ourselves, we express ourselves through our word. We communicate ourselves. We reveal what is in our heart and in our mind, and we reveal about ourselves through our word, our spoken word. And so in the same way, here, the, the word of God is telling us, the, the Bible is telling us that Jesus Christ is the perfect word of God, the perfect expression, the perfect uh, revelation of who God is. Now, if we think about the Bible as the word of God, we know that this is something that tells us about God. But when we're talking about the living word, Jesus Christ, the logos, as the Greek word has it, the logos of God, this is the revelation of God, not a revelation about God. This is the revelation of God himself. We see this in the words it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, so distinct from the Father, and the word was God, the express image exactly as the Father is. And so they were together, but before creation, there was nothing else except for God and his word. And of course, we know his spirit. But we know that here what we're seeing is, is that God expresses himself, reveals himself perfectly through his word. And so it says, verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. And then verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory. The glory is the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. So now we're able to get to the first part of our answer. Why is it appropriate for God the Father to make this man, Jesus Christ, who was crucified by the Jews and the Romans, that is the Jews and the Gentiles, all men came together and conspired against the Lord and against his anointed Christ, and they put him to death. Why is it appropriate that God would make him the king over his kingdom? 
The first answer is because he is the very image, the express image, the very word and revelation of God, and that he was God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So who else would sit on the throne of God except his very image? His very revelation would be sitting on that throne, ruling over all the nations. And so we know that this word became flesh in the man Christ Jesus, and that God exalted this man to be made, he made him Lord in Christ. Why is that appropriate? Because that man is the word of God, become flesh. And so we have a first answer is that because he is the revelation of God, that means he is God. He is God, and so it's appropriate that he sits on the throne, ruling over God's kingdom. But here in the same chapter, let's look at another reason why it's appropriate that he, this man, Jesus Christ, was made Lord of heaven and earth. In verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only son who is at the father's side has made him known. So now it begins to speak of the word. The word is, when you speak of the word, is something really connected with God. That that's the, the expression of God. Uh, it's the communication of God, the revelation of God, the very image of God. We see that it's very connected. So you have God and his word, and they are one. But then when we talk in verse 18, it says, No one has seen God at any time. The only son who is at the father's side, that is in his bosom and in his lap, the one that is close to him, that is intimate with him. You know, we saw here in the beginning was the Lord and the word was with God. But here we say, in what way was the word with God? He was, in, he was with the father intimately as a son. So he's called the son of God. And so we can see the connection. We can understand why the revelation or the very image of God, the word of God would be called the son of God. Why? Because he images him. He is just like him. He appears just like him. But on the other hand, we can also understand that he is has a relationship with the father. And it's not just a relationship of, of God and his word, but of God, the father and his son. And so there is a loving relationship between the two. We can see if we flip over to John chapter 15. Now remember, John chapter 15 is still in John. I'm sorry, John 17 is still in the book of John where it started with, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Uh, and we see here in John chapter 17, verse five. And now, O Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory which I had with you before the world existed. So we see that the, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. That is exactly what is being expressed here. And But he calls him father. And so the son of God was with the father and glorified with the father from the beginning. And so we are able to understand that. But then it goes on and tells us more clearly in verse uh, 24. Still John chapter 17, verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me will be with me where I am, that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the creation of the world. So before all things were created, the father loved his son. That is, the, the, that God himself loved his word. The very express image of who he is, he loved him as a son. And so they have a relationship between father and son because he loved you, for you loved me before the creation of the world because they were together before the creation of the world and it, he was well pleasing to the father. Jesus said, the father is always with me because I do all those things that are pleasing to him. The father was always pleased with the son from all eternity. He loved him from all eternity. If we flip over to Colossians, Colossians chapter, let's see, Colossians chapter one, verse three, we read this or verse 13, I'm sorry. Verse 13, I'll start in verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has enabled us to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So we hear, we see, that this was God's dear son. As we saw in John chapter one, verse 18, that the son, that is the word of God, who was with God from the beginning and through whom he created all things, was the son of God, was loved by the father, was the dear son of the father. So it's appropriate 
that God would have his glorious son, who was always glorified with him, whom he loved to be seated on his throne. Just as we look in earthly kingdoms and earthly dynasties, that the father, whenever the father leaves, then the son becomes the king. But in this kingdom, it's just like when David was still alive, he had his son Solomon and he was already seated on the throne. And so the son is ruling on behalf of the father. Okay, so we see that this is why it's appropriate that the man who was crucified, Jesus of Nazareth, would be made Lord of heaven and earth because he is the Father's Son, the everlasting Son of God. Let's flip over to Hebrews 1 again, something we skimmed over before. Let's start in verse 1. God, who at various times and in diverse ways spoke long ago to the fathers through the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Now we know what that means, that He was always with the Father. He was the Word of God and was loved by the Father, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the world. So again, we see in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God because the exact revelation of God. And all things were created through him and without him, nothing was created that has been created. We see that in John chapter 1. If we flip there again, John chapter 1. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 3, all things were created through him, and without him nothing was created that was created. That means everything that's been created was created through the Son, which means the Son was not created. The, the Word of God was not a created thing, because all things that have been created were created through the Son. So we see here in Hebrews again, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, he is appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the world. And so we see that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. That God the Father, how did God the Father create? God the Father created through his Son. That is, that the Son was the one that created all things according to the will of the Father. So if we continue on, uh, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made all things, this is Hebrews 1 verse 2, verse 3 says, He is the brightness of his glory, the express image of himself, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. So we see that he is the redeemer because the one that created all things, the word of God, after man sinned, after he followed after the devil and all things fell into corruption and death, who is rightfully the one that would come and redeem all things and recreate all things except the very word through whom God created all things in the first place. So God created all things through him And when they fell into sin, God has now recreated and made a new creation through him and redeemed all things through him. He is the creator. He is the redeemer. If we switch over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we read this. But for us, there is but one God, the Father, for whom are all things and for whom we exist. So there's one God, the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, was with the Father. Okay, but for us, there is one God, the Father, for whom are all things and whom we exist. So what does it mean, from whom are all things? That means that all created things came uh, from and were for the Father, all things. Now, if we go to the next part of this verse, it says, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. So what does this mean? All things means the same things. All created things came through him, were created from by the Father through him. So it, it, we see that it is he is the creator of all things. So why is it appropriate that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, sits on the throne over all of creation? Because he is the one who created all things. Why is it appropriate that he is the judge? Because he is the one that came and redeemed this world. And now he is seated at the right hand of God to save those that come to him and to judge those that reject him. He is right to sit on the throne and it is right that all creatures in heaven and on earth would bow their knee to the glory or to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, confess him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because he is bringing about the Father's will in creating all things, and he is doing the Father's will in redeeming all things. We see the the will of God being in redemption. If we go to Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age. 
So we see it's he is the redeemer according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we see that God receives the glory through Jesus Christ bringing redemption. Uh, he is the creator and he is the redeemer, and this brings glory to his Father. Let's see this elsewhere if we flip over to Matthew chapter 1, that Jesus is, okay, we see that he's the creator, but also that he is the redeemer. So here we see that he's the redeemer, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says this. Uh, this is an angel speaking to uh, Mary. I believe it's the angel. Uh, or no, it's God speaking to it in a dream to Joseph in, about the son that is conceived in Mary. In verse 21, it says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So what does it mean, the name Jesus? In it means Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh saves. Okay, so now we want to ask the question, uh, who is the one that saves? But we go on. So Yahweh saves. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Yahweh saves. For he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus Christ is the salvation of God. He is the one that saves. He is Yahweh because it is Yahweh that saves. For he will save his people from their sins. He is the Redeemer. If we flip over to uh, Revelation chapter 5 or chapter 4, we see something very clear about this fact. In Revelation chapter 4, if we were to read through all this, I'm not going to take time to read through all this, but basically it's, it's, a, it's a vision of God seated on his throne. And when they, they say in verse 8, for the living creatures had six wings each, and they were covered with eyes all around, all day and night, without ceasing. They were saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. It goes down in verse uh, 10. The 12, 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him uh, who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns down before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So, God willed all things to create. He is the source of all things. How did he create all things? Through his word, through his son, whom he's appointed heir of all things. But then if we flip over to Revelation chapter five, as we read through there, we see about the lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who was slain, and he is the only one that was found worthy to come and take the scroll from the ancient of days who was seated on his throne. And in verse nine, we see, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne, the living creatures and the elders and voice of many angels numbering 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. In other words, God, created all things through his word. And then God redeemed all th things through his word, who is his son, who is always with him and is the creator of all things. Verse 13, then I heard every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the sea or under the earth and in the sea and all that are in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb to be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. So the creator and his son, are forever and ever glorified together. Jesus said, those that do not honor me do not honor the Father. And so if we reject the Son, we reject the Father because he's the very image and revelation of who God is. He is God manifest in the flesh. And it's for this reason that it is appropriate that he is seated on the throne, that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, that he is ruling as king over God's kingdom. He is the Christ. If we flip over to uh, Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. So we have God the Father. We have the everlasting God that's unapproachable, immortal, invisible. And we have the image, the word of God, the son of God who perfectly reveals the father, that we did not know the father, but the son of God who is in his very bosom, who is with him from the beginning and through whom he created all things, he reveals the father to us because he is the express image of the father, exact duplicate of the father. He is the image 
of the invisible God and the firstborn of every creation. So what is it, a creature? What does it mean that he is the firstborn over every creature? Now, in our days, when we think of the firstborn, that means he's going to be the oldest. But in biblical times, the firstborn was a position that you had. It was the one that was the one that had the honor in the family that was going to receive the inheritance. So it said he is the firstborn of, of all every creature or over every creature. So uh, Jehovah's Witness and others uh, will try to say that, no, 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 Jesus is the firstborn because he was the first created by God. But if we go on and we look and we see this, what the meaning of firstborn here is in this passage. For by him all things were created. So why is he the firstborn of every creature, uh, over every creature or of every creature? For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. So all things were created. We saw in John chapter 1, it said that all things that have been made were made through him. And we saw in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, it said that, all things come from God and all things came through Jesus Christ, which means he was in the beginning with the Father when all things were made. So all things that are made does not include Jesus Christ because he is not created. He is the word of God and God has never been without his word. So it says, and it, it emphasizes all things by saying this, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. In other words, everything that you can think about, whether spiritual, physical, rocks or seas or oceans or stars or, uh, you know, whatever it is that you can, you can fathom and think about in your mind, all these things were created by him, by Jesus Christ, the very image and firstborn of every creature. And it goes on and says this, and here's how we know what firstborn means in this passage in particular. All things were created by him and for him. So all things were created for him. He is the heir. So what does it mean to be the firstborn? It means to be the heir of all things, to have the preeminence in the family that he is the one that is seated on the throne, that he is the one that all things were created for. So God loved his son from all eternity and he set, sits him on the throne so that he will inherit all things. So he is the firstborn. He is the heir of all things. And we saw this. Also in Hebrews, if we flip back to Hebrews, I skimmed over it, but we saw in verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. In other words, he is the firstborn. He is the one that gets the inheritance. It's not the second, burn, the second born or the third born, but it's the firstborn that gets the inheritance and through whom he made the world. So all things were created through him and for him. So he is the heir of of all things and for this reason it is appropriate that he is the one seated on the throne ruling over all things because God's plan when he loved his son from all eternity it says that you love me before the world was created that he was with the father and that he was in the bosom of the father God's desire was to create all things through his son but also for his son that it would be an inheritance for the Son of God. This is why it's appropriate that this word, this Son, that became flesh in the man Jesus Christ is now exalted to the right hand of God and is Lord of heaven and earth because he is the heir. So we see that it is appropriate that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was made uh, Lord or made king over God's kingdom. Uh, one, because he is God. He is the very revelation and express image of God. Two, he's the son of God that's been loved by the father and been in the bosom of the father from all eternity. He was with God in the beginning. Uh, three, because all things were created through him. He's the creator of all things, but not only the creator, the recreator, because he is the redeemer of all things. He is Yeshua. That is Yahweh saves. He is the one that came to save his people from their sins and he is the one that seated with the father on the ancient of the ancient of days on the throne and that he is receiving glory forever and ever also because he is the heir that god's son is the one that was meant to inherit all things and all things were created for him and through him or through him and for him that was the purpose that they were created and if we go to ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 through 10 we see the purpose of all things verse 9 Making known, we'll start in verse 8, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. So this is the mystery of the will of God Almighty. This is the mystery of God. 
the, his, a mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, what he planned, which he purposed in himself. This is the plan and counsel of God. What is it? As a plan for the fullness of time, that means it's going to happen in history at a particular time, to unite all things in Christ, which are in heaven and are on earth. In other words, that God's eternal plan was to create all things. And why was he creating all things? He was creating it for his son. He was creating all things so that his son would have preeminence and would inherit all things. So he created all things through Jesus Christ and he created, created them for Jesus Christ. The very purpose, the very purpose of your existence, of my existence, of all existence, of all of history, the very purpose was to make Jesus Christ as a man who came to redeem us, the word of God that became flesh, to sit him on the throne that he would rule over everything. We saw in John chapter 17 verse 5 that you, you know it says glorify me with the glory that I had with you from before the world began. And so that was his original place, but he became flesh for our salvation, went to the cross, and he because he obeyed the Father all the way into death as a perfect man, God raised him from the dead and gave him glory. And now at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth, all things are united in him. And this is to the glory of God, the father, because all things came from the father and all things came through the son and they came through the son so that they could be given to the son in the fullness of time. This is the very purpose of all creation. So I hope we can see as we flip back to Acts chapter two, verse 36. I want us to get this nailed down as we're talking about the kingdom of God, as we're talking about the gospel and trying to get a firm footing on what it is, that what's the very foundations of the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We discussed that in a previous video, you know, the relation of those terms. But as we're trying to understand the gospel, we need to understand it's all about Jesus Christ being exalted as Lord because he is the word and revelation of God. He is God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So it's right that he sits on the throne. So when we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel assuredly know that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Then somebody says, well, how could this be? How could God take a man and sit him on the throne to rule over all of God's creation because he is the word and revelation of God. He is God. All things were created through him. All things have been redeemed through him. So it is right that he sits on the throne over all things because he is the son of God whom God has always loved and planned to be his heir. And so all things were created through him and for him. And this is the very purpose and the plan of all creation was for and focused on Jesus Christ. All things were created for him. And so we need to understand that if someone says, yes, I am, uh, I'm following God, but I'm not submitted to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ was simply a man that was exalted and, and made the Lord. And so I'm not going to worship and I'm not going to serve and I'm not going to live for a man. We need to understand that if somebody rejects this man, Jesus Christ, who is the mediator between God and man, who has been exalted to the right hand of God, they are rejecting God the Father because it's the very purpose and plan of God was to exalt his son and to unite all things under the lordship of Jesus Christ, all things in heaven and all things on earth because he is worthy. Not only is he worthy as a man because he obeyed unto death, even death on a cross and was therefore highly exalted, but he is worthy because he is God. He is the very image and express image of God. God. He is the son of God from all eternity in the bosom of the father. He is the one who reveals God and shows God to us. He is the heir of God. All things were created through him and for him. This is the purpose of creation. And this is the purpose of our lives to serve God's son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.